Hello, welcome everyone. This is a brief overview of the structures uh, related to the anatomy of the ear, nose, and throat diseases. Uh, and we can start with the anatomy of the ear. You probably know by now that the ear comprises of three subparts. There is an external ear, uh, then we've got a middle ear, and then we've got an inner ear. Uh, we can actually understand that by uh, trying to understand this illustration over here. So what you can see here is basically a coronal or a side-to-side -side section which has been taken through the skull. The section actually has been taken at the level uh, where the temporal bone is present. And you can actually see the three different subparts of the ear clearly shown over here. The ear, as we mentioned, cons consists of an external middle and the inner ear. So we can see the external ear over here. Uh, followed by the middle ear and then the inner ear. Much of the ear is residing inside the petrous part of the temporal bone shown here. Uh, in the lateral wall, this, this bony region here represents the lateral wall of the skull. Uh, we can see the cranial cavity at the top over here. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone and down below we can see the base of the skull uh, show, uh, and, and you can see the little styloid process popping out from the base of the skull further confirming that we are looking at the base of the skull. Right, so the external ear, starting with the external ear, we can see that the external ear has a part which is visible on the outside, which is the auricle or the pinna, which is nothing but a cartilaginous framework covered over by the skin. Uh, the auricle or the pinna then continues inside uh, as the external ear canal or the external acoustic nucleus, part of which is uh, cartilaginous and part of which is bony. The auricle doesn't uh, serve much function in case of uh, the humans. However, in case of the lower mammals, the extra auricular muscles are quite well developed. And so the auricle can, can play an important role in directing the sound waves towards the external ear canal, which is uh, shown over here by these uh, red color-coded lines. Uh, so the ear sound waves, uh, they are going to be transmitted from the auricle through the auricle into the external ear canal. These sound waves are then eventually going to hit against the structure over here, which is known as the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane separates the external ear from this space over here, which is basically the middle ear cavity. Any obstruction to the flow of the sound waves uh, across this entire pathway results in a specific kind of deafness, which is known as the conductive deafness. And later on in our subsequent lectures, and as part of the clinical skills training as well, we'll talk about different kinds of deafnesses, such as the conductive and sensory neural deafnesses, and how to differentiate between them using certain tuning fork tests. Uh, but for now, what you have to know is that uh, a conductive deafness results in uh, uh, because of uh, the obstruction to the flow of the sound waves in the external ear canal. Right, so now uh, the sound waves, uh, the sound vibrations are then uh, eventually transmitted uh, from the external ear into the middle ear cavity. Uh, for that, the sound waves have to hit against the tympanic membrane. They need to vibrate the tympanic membrane, and these sound wave vibrations are then transmitted to the middle ear cavity uh, to through, through certain bony structures inside the middle ear cavity, which are known as the ossicles. Uh, we'll come to that in a second, but first of all, let's have a look at the structure of the tympanic membrane over here. See, this is the tympanic membrane, and we're actually looking at the tympanic membrane from the outside, which means basically from the side of the external ear canal. So if, if you look here, this is basically magnified, uh, zoomed in coronal section of the same uh, illustration which we saw in the previous slide. Uh, we can see the external ear canal, we can see the tympanic membrane, and then we can see the middle ear cavity containing these little bony ossicles, the middle ear ossicles, and we'll talk about those in a second as well. Uh, the tympanic membrane, uh, if uh, you you can what you can see over here, see this is the first bony ossicle, which is known as the malleus, present inside the middle ear cavity. The malleus has got a long handle to it, and that handle is tightly pasted on the inner aspect of the tympanic membrane, kind of pulling it in tightly. And as a result, you can see that much of the tympanic membrane is really tense. This region is known as the pars tensa, and you can see the impression of that handle, handle of the malleus, which is attached on the inner side of the tympanic membrane. Uh, 
uh, the one of the clinical significance of uh, this uh, tense uh, this tenseness inside the tympanic membrane is that it, it basically creates a kind of an angle which is known as the umbo uh, you can see appreciate that angle over here because of the uh, because of the pull of the malleus and what you can and what, what happens is that uh, because because of this angulated uh, uh, positioning of the tympanic membrane when uh, uh, we examine the external ear when we examine the tympanic membrane through an instrument which is known as the otoscope then as part of the otoscopy when light is thrown or shown on the tympanic membrane uh, it creates a bit of a reflection over here which is known as the cone of light and we expect to see that cone of light uh, as a normal finding in the tympanic membrane if this cone of light is not there then that might uh, potentially mean that there is uh, some kind of a change in the density of the uh, medium inside the middle ear cavity normally we expect to find air inside the middle ear cavity and the density might have uh, increased because of uh, let's say of uh, the, by the accumulation of fluid inside the middle ear cavity as a result of, uh, of, uh, of an inflammation of the mucosa of the middle ear cavity, uh, a condition which is uh, sometimes referred to as the otitis media. So being able to see this cone of light is really important uh, clinically from a clinical standpoint. Right, so now then what you can see over here is that uh, the middle ear cavity contains three little uh, bony ossicles over here. These are known as the malleus. We already talked about the malleus. The malleus has a long handle attached to the tympanic membrane, pulling it in, creating a bit of an angle over here. The malleus then is attached over here to the second ossicle, uh, which is the incus, and the incus has got a long handle to it, and that incus is then attached over here to this piston like structure, the third bony ossicle, which is known as the stapes. The stapes has got uh, a big flat base to it, which is then attached here to the inner ear, which you can uh, partly see over here. Uh, and you can also appreciate that the inner ear is also residing inside the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now, when the sound waves, they hit upon the tympanic membrane, they're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. And these vibrations or oscillations are then going to be transmitted through the ossicles inside the middle ear cavity, which begin to vibrate as well. Uh, these vibrations are transmitted to the malleus, from malleus to the incus, from incus to the stapes, and eventually stapes acts as a, as a kind of a piston and punches into the inner ear and as a result those vibrations are then transmitted from the air medium inside the middle ear cavity into the fluid medium inside the inner ear cavity and then eventually in the inner ear the vibrations are going to be transmitted into electrical signals which we will probably discuss in some subsequent lecture either as part of the ENT uh, module or as part of the uh, neuroanatomy. In the we're looking over here at the middle ear cavity, and we're looking at the middle ear cavity from the inside. So you can see the inner aspect of the tympanic membrane. You can see the long handle of the malleus, followed by the incus, and then the stapes. The stapes is going to be attached to the to the inner ear. You can see there that there are uh, two muscles which we can see inside the middle ear cavity. One of those muscles is uh, this one over here, which is known as the tensor tympani muscle. See, the tensor tympani muscle is coming from the, from the nasopharyngeal tube, which is actually a connection between the middle ear cavity and the nasopharynx. This is the eustachian tube or the pharyngeotympanic tube. And uh, the tensor tympani uh, muscle, which originates from this tube is attached here to the long handle of the malleus. One of the important actions of this muscle is that uh, it pulls the handle of the malleus when it contracts. So uh, normally when the sound waves hit upon the tympanic membrane, they're going to cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate with a very large angle. Those oscillations are going to be transmitted to the ossicles, to the malleus, incus, and stapes, and they're going to vibrate uh, or will try to vibrate with a crazy large amplitude as well. These large oscillations or these large uh, amplitude vibrations are going to be transmitted to the inner ear, and uh, this needs to be kept in check by the contraction uh, of these, this muscle over here, the tensor tympani. So the tensor tympani basically uh, kept in 
keeps in check the movement with the size of the oscillation of these ossicles and hence as a result uh, acts as a protective mechanism uh, uh, against uh, loud hearing and consequently if there is a paralysis of the nerve which is innervating this muscle uh, such as the fifth cranial nerve which is inner which is innervating this muscle that leads to a condition which is known as hyperacusis so the vibrations uh, are not going to be kept in check uh, and as a result the person is going to hear louder than usual something which is known as a hyperacusis uh, the similar uh, function is also performed by another muscle here inside the middle ear cavity which is known as the stapedius. That muscle is uh, attached to the ossicle which is the stapes and the muscle is innervated by a nerve called the facial nerve and uh, this muscle does the same job as well prevents the crazy large uh, uh, oscillation of the stapes of the ossicles and if there's a lesion of the facial nerve uh, and paralysis consequent paralysis of this uh, stapedius muscle that would again lead to uh, the patient presenting with something known as the hyperacusis. You can see another important nerve passing in between the malleus and the incus through the middle ear cavity, which is known as the corda tympani. Corda tympani is a branch of the facial nerve, and it transmits uh, it transmits the taste fibers and also transmits the secretomotor parasympathetic fibers to the sublingual and submandibular salivary glands and consequently a middle ear infection can uh, potentially present with some taste impairments and with uh, a decrease in production of the saliva uh, or the dryness of the mouth uh, then uh, there is another nerve which is worth knowing in context of the ear anatomy and we're going to be talking about those nerves in detail as well in, in a little bit and that nerve is the glossopharyngeal nerve which uh, basically carries the general sensations from the mucosa lining the middle ear cavity so any any uh, disease such as the otitis media which results in uh, fluid accumulation and uh, fullness inside the middle ear cavity that uh, fullness would actually lead to a pressure sensation of discomfort inside uh, the middle ear cavity which will be uh, those those feelings of dis discomfort and pressure sensations are going to are going to be transmitted through the glossopharyngeal nerve all right so after the middle ear cavity we come to the third part which is of the ear which is the inner ear uh, once again we're looking at the coronal section through the uh, through the skull, we can see the external ear, the tympanic membrane, the ossicles inside the middle ear cavity, and then the stapes connected with the inner ear. Uh, the inner ear is comprising of two subparts. Uh, you can see this coil part over here which is known as the cochlea the main function of this part is hearing the the main function of this part over here this is the vestibular part and this is concerned with the balance which has uh, this is uh, this sac like structure over here which is known as the bony vestibule and then we've got the semicircular canals or the ducts over here uh, this part is concerned uh, with the balance regulation uh, the, the oscillations which are transmitted over here uh, through the stapes into the inner ear are eventually uh, converted into electrical signals inside the inner ear, inside the cochlea, and then uh, the these sound waves, uh, once converted into electrical signals, are then transmitted uh, through the cochlear part of the vestibulocochlear nerve uh, into the brain. The vestibulocochlear nerve is our eighth cranial nerve. So the vestibulocochlear nerve comprises of two subparts, a cochlear and the vestibular part. Cochlear is the component which carries sound signals, uh, electrical signals concerned with the sound from the cochlea. The vestibular part of the vestibulocochlear nerve then carries the balance uh, information regarding the balance from the vestibular part. Right, so the next structure we can talk about is the nose. The nose is involved in respiration and is the olfactory organ of our body. Uh, the nose can be divided into an external nose, uh, internal nose, and then we can talk about the paranasal sinuses as well in context of the description of the nose. Uh, 
But let's start with understanding this illustration over here. So what we're looking over here is basically a mid-sagittal section taken through the head and neck region. You can see the nasal cavity over here. Uh, this is the roof of the nasal cavity. And then you can see the roof separating the nasal cavity from the cranial cavity at the top where the brain is going to be residing. This is the floor of the nasal cavity, which is formed by the palate. And the palate then forms the roof of the oral cavity down below. So that separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity down below. Uh, the nasal cavity uh, and the oral cavity are both part of the airway system of our body, and they are lying in front of the food pipe or the food passage, which is the pharynx. Right, so the nasal cavities can be seen lying over here. These are mucosa-lined cavities, which are separated from each other by the nasal septum. So there is one nasal cavity on either side separated by the nasal septum. Uh, the nasal cavity communicates to the exterior through the external nares or the external uh, nostrils. Uh, this region over here is known as the nasal vestibule. Uh, the nasal cavity then communicates posteriorly with the pharynx or the nasal pharynx through the internal nares. This opening over here is known as the coeni. Uh, within the nasal cavity, the superior part is the olfactory area, and that uh, and this is the part which contains the olfactory receptors. The respiratory area then is the remainder of the cavity. The dilated space, as we mentioned, internal to the nares over here is known as the nasal vestibule. Uh, now, the nasal cavity it is, is, is a box-like structure, so it has a floor to it, it has a roof to it, it has a medial wall to it, and then it has a lateral wall to it. And we already know about the two openings of the, of the box over here of the nasal cavity, the external and the internal nares. Let's talk about the different uh, surfaces or the walls of the uh, the, of this rectangular nasal cavity. Right, so starting with the roof of the nasal cavity, once again, we're looking at a mid-sagittal section taken through the skull. The nasal cavity can be seen over here. The roof of the nasal cavity is actually formed by four bones, which have been color-coded over here. We've got the nasal bone in the front, followed by this blue-colored bone, the frontal bone, and you can see the frontal paranasal air sinus here as well. And then uh, the third bone, which, which, which contributes to the roof of the nasal cavity, is the ethmoid bone. This is the cribriform part of the ethmoid bone or the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and it is known as cribriform plate because it has loads of holes in it or it is porous and these pores are basically meant for the passage of olfactory nerves taking the sense of smell from the olfactory mucosa through the cribriform plate into the cranial cavity where these signals are then going to be transmitted to the uh, to the olfactory bulbs at the base of the brain. Uh, the fourth bone, which is uh, color-coded in yellow over here, this is the sphenoid bone contributing to the roof of the nasal cavity. And you can see the, uh, the, the sphenoidal uh, paranasal air sinus over here as well. Then we go over to the floor of the nasal cavity, the floor of the hard pellet, which is also the roof of the oral cavity. The hard pellet is formed primarily from two bones, uh, the maxilla in the front uh, and, the, and the palatine bone at the back. If you want to be a little bit more specific and we'll study that in detail in, in the osteology of the skull, that this is actually the palatine process of the maxilla color-coded in green, and this is the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. But I mean, then we go over to the medial wall of the nasal cavity, which is the nasal septum. This is partly cartilaginous and partly bony. There are two bones which contribute to the nasal septum. Mainly, those are the vomer down below over here, which is an independent bone in itself. And then we've got a part of the ethmoid bone at the top, which is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. And we'll talk about the structure of the nose in much more detail when we go over to the separate lecture on the nose and paranasal sinuses as part of the ENT module. Lastly, we've got the lateral wall of the nasal cavity here. See, the floor can be seen down below here. That's the pellet. This is the roof over here. The nasal septum has been removed now, and we can see the lateral wall nasal of the nasal cavity, which is characterized by these bony shells, which are known as the conchi. The conchi are the bony shells, and the 
Ear channels created underneath these conchi are known as the meatuses. So we've got a superior concha, a middle concha, and an inferior concha. And consequently, we've got a superior meatus underneath it, a middle meatus, and then an inferior meatus over here. These conchi basically increase the surface area of the respiratory mucosa and therefore uh, due to the uh, to warming of the ear and humidifying uh, uh, the ear, uh, the air as it enters from the external environment into the into the nasal cavity. Right now, uh, there are different paranasal air sinuses in different bones uh, uh, of the skull, and those paranasal air sinuses, if if you consider them from an embryological standpoint, they're basically they're basically outpouchings of our nasal cavity into the different bones and consequently the mucosa which is lining the nasal cavity uh, that is continuous with the lining of these paranasal air sinuses as well so these air sinuses actually drain into the lateral wall of the nasal cavity as they're basically out pouchings of the nasal cavity uh, and uh, this space over here which is just above the superior nasal uh, concha. This is known as the sphenoethmoidal recess, and you can see the sphenoid sinus anatomically very closely situated to it, so it is uh, logistically in, 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 a, in a very good position to drain into the sphenoethmoidal recess. Then we've got another space over here, which is the superior meatus underneath the superior concha, and the posterior ethmoidal air cells are going to drain into the superior meatus. Uh, then down below here in the inferior meatus, we've got the nasolacrimal duct draining into it. And then all the other uh, air sinuses, uh, including the maxillary sinus, the middle ethmoidal air cells, the frontal sinus, along with the anterior ethmoidal air cells through the frontal nasal duct, they all drain into the middle uh, meatus. So the bottom line uh, what you have to know is that all the air sinuses, paranasal air sinuses, drain into the lateral wall, into the middle meatus, with the exception of one sinus for every other space. Nasal lacrimal duct drains into the inferior meatus, the sphenoidal sinus drains into the sphenoidal recess, and then posterior ethmoidal air cells drain into the superior meatus. Uh, there are three nerves which innervate the nasal cavity. Those are the olfactory nerves, uh, which carry the sense of smell passing through the cribriform plate to the olfactory bulb of the base at the base of the brain we already discussed about that uh, the general sensations from the mucosa of nasal cavity are carried by the trigeminal nerve uh, and then parasympathetic innervation secretomotor innervation to the to the to the glands and brought into the nasal cavity through the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve here uh, the major arterial supply to the nasal cavity are from branches of the ophthalmic artery and the maxillary artery. Uh, the venous drainage of the nose mainly follows the arteries. Right, so now let's talk a little bit about the throat. Uh, so throat is the region of the neck which is anterior to the cervical vertebrae. Uh, it comprises of various structures pertaining to the endocrine, respiratory, and digestive systems, and hence in that context, we will briefly review the anatomy of structures such as the larynx, the pharynx, and associated structures including the palate and perhaps the thyroid gland as well, which is clasping over the larynx. Uh, so let's resort to these two illustrations over here uh, to help describe the throat region briefly. What you're looking over here is basically the head and neck region from the front. So you can see the throat region from the front in this illustration over here. And if you take a mid-sagittal section through the head and neck region, a mid-sagittal anteroposterior section, then we can see uh, the structures on the mid-sagittal view over here. The cut section of those structures are visible here. So uh, starting from uh, the top over here, we can see the hyoid bone, right? See, that's just underneath the mandible. That's the mandible or the lower jaw, and we can see the hyoid bone underneath here. The hyoid is a U-shaped bone, so we can actually see the front of that U, the body of the hyoid bone over here. The two cornu of the hyoid bone, they project backwards and sideways. 
uh, if we take a mid sagittal section through the head and neck region here then we will be able to see uh, the section of the body of the hyoid bone right over here see this is the mandible the cut section of the mandible that's the floor of our oral cavity and then the hyoid bone can be seen over here obviously uh, we can't see the cornu of the hyoid bone because they're more laterally placed structures we can only see the cut section of the body in a mid sagittal section then we go down from the hyoid bone. So if you go down over here, we can see the larynx. This is the uh, this is one of the uh, cartilages of the larynx, which we can see here. That is an unpaired cartilage known as the thyroid cartilage. Uh, this is the midline, and at the midline, we can actually see the fusion of the two lamina of the thyroid cartilage. This is the lamina on the right side. This is the lamina on the left side. They fuse in the midline over here to create a bit of a prominence, which is known as the Adam's apple. Uh, once again, taking a mid-sagittal section over here will actually uh, enable us to see the thyroid cartilage over here. This is the midline, so we can't really see the entire lamina here, but that's the area which is the Adam's apple, which I was referring to. So we can see the hyoid bone at the top and then the, uh, and then the thyroid cartilage down below. Now beneath the thyroid cartilage, beneath the thyroid cartilage over here, we can see an unpaired cartilage again, which belongs to the cartilaginous framework of the larynx, and that is known as the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage is a ring-shaped cartilage, and it has an a very narrow anterior arch to it, which we can see here. The anterior arch is narrow, but the posterior aspect of that ring is broad, and that is the broad posterior lamina. Uh, we can't obviously see that over here, but if we take a mid sagittal section through the head and neck once again, we would be able to see the cut section of that ring at two different points, anteriorly and posteriorly. Now, remember we said this was the cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, so underneath that somewhere over here would be the cricoid cartilage, which is not visible in this section. Uh, so anterior arch is not visible here, but the broad posterior lamina is visible over here. This is a section taken through the broad posterior lamina, right? Remember, this is an anteroposterior section, so if we cut through the ring, we'll be able to see a section of the ring in the front and a section of the ring at the back. That's a broad posterior lamina here. So we're basically inside the inside the laryngeal cavity now and we're talking about the cartilages which are covering over the larynx right so then further going down over here we can see the thyroid gland the thyroid gland has a narrow anterior isthmus to it and two big lateral lobes connected at the isthmus uh, the isthmus is roughly present around the second and third tracheal cartilaginous rings. So if you go down from the larynx, you can see the trachea, the C-shaped tracheal cartilaginous ring. So the larynx continues down as the air pipe. Uh, the food pipe, the food system is always going to be behind the airway. Uh, now I'm going to I'm gonna actually uh, take the help of this illustration to describe the structures in a bit more detail to you guys. So if we look over here, this is a magnified view of the mid sagittal section of the head and neck, right? And like uh, if we if we about the structures pertaining uh, to the ear, nose, and throat diseases, then we are actually focusing on this region over here. Uh, now in this mid sagittal section, we can see at the top this is the nasal cavity. See, this is the roof of the nasal cavity, and this is this is actually the base of the brain, which is formed by various bones. We covered some of the bones uh, previously as well when we were talking about the bones forming the roof of the nasal cavity, such as the nasal bone, the frontal bone, the crib reform plate of ethmoid, and then the sphenoid bone characterized by the sphenoidal ear sinus here. This entire base of the brain is going to be uh, a separating the cranial cavity at the top from the nasal cavity down below. Now, the nasal cavity, it's remember the airway is always going to be in the front, so the nasal cavity can be seen in the front here with the nasal pharynx behind it. Oral cavity can be seen in the front here with the oropharynx behind it, and larynx can be seen in the front here with the laryngopharynx behind it. Then the larynx continues down as the trachea, and the laryngopharynx continues down as the esophagus, so the air system is always in front of the food system. Uh, now, if this is a section of the nasal cavity, then we are actually looking at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity because we can see three bony shells hanging from the lateral wall. These are known as the conchi. We've got the superior concha, the middle concha, and the inferior concha. So that's the hallmark of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And these concha increase the surface area of the respiratory mucosa for 
warming up the air and humidifying the air as we breathe it in. Uh, now, if we behind, go behind the nasal cavity, these are the posterior nasal apertures, and through those apertures, we're going to enter into the region of the pharynx, which is known as the nasal pharynx. See, the nasal pharynx is uh, roofed over here by the sphenoid bone, and this is actually the area where uh, one of our uh, tonsils is going to be residing, which is known as the nasopharyngeal tonsil. And this is the tonsil if it gets pathologically enlarged in case of in case of kids. This is known. Uh, this becomes what is known as the adenoids, and it can cause a respiratory obstruction over here potentially because the air passage, uh, the, the this this region in the uh, in the kids is really small, and any enlargement of the tonsillar tissue can obstruct the airway over here. Uh, so now what we're looking over here is the lateral wall of the nasal pharynx. This was the roof of the nasal pharynx. This is the lateral wall. The lateral wall is characterized by this opening over here, which is an opening for the nasal, which is an opening for the eustachian tube. The eustachian or the pharyngeotympanic tube is the connection between the nasal pharynx and the middle ear cavity. Sometimes when people have uh, inflammation of the nasal pharynx region, such as the nasal pharyngitis, then this uh, this this tube, the mucosa, which is actually lining the tube, can get blocked because of inflammation, because of swelling, and that can actually lead uh, to a disconnect between the middle ear cavity and the nasal pharynx, and that can lead to a negative pressure building up inside the middle ear cavity. Which, uh, so anyways, now if you go further down over here, then this region is the oral cavity, and you can see the roof of the oral cavity being formed by the pellet, the hard pellet in the front, and then the soft pellet at the back. Down below here, we can see the floor of oral cavity formed by different muscles, and the tongue can be seen resting on the oral cavity. Behind the tongue over here, this is another accumulation of the uh, lymphoid tissue, which is known as the lingual tonsil, which is uh, which is the second group of the tonsillar tissue which we have discussed now. So we've got a nasopharyngeal tonsil at the top in the in the roof of the nasopharynx, and then we've got a lingual tonsil at the back of the tongue. Uh, the oral cavity is going to be the anterior relation of this part of the pharynx, which is the oral pharynx. So if you go through this opening over here, then we're going to enter into this region, which is the oral pharynx. The oral pharynx has, in its lateral wall, uh, it's not really clearly visible in this um, in this illustration, in this picture over here, but there's another accumulation of the tonsillar tissue here, which is known as the palatine tonsil. And this is the tonsil, which we usually refer to when we talk about uh, tonsillar enlargement and tonsillectomy. To me. Uh, so this is the oropharynx. The oropharynx then continues down at this part of the pharynx, which is the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is going to be the posterior relation of the larynx. So we can see different cartilages of the larynx over here. For instance, we can see the epiglottis. The epiglottis can be seen uh, connecting with the with the thyroid cartilage. And remember, this is the mid sagittal section of the thyroid cartilage, so we can cannot see the lamina of the thyroid cartilage. Uh, then underneath the thyroid cartilage, we can see the cricoid. Cricoid, remember, was a ring-shaped cartilage. So we're looking at the narrow anterior arch over here and the broad posterior lamina of the ring. This is a mid-sagittal section. So we'll be, if we have a mid-sagittal section through a ring-shaped structure, we'll have a view of the cut section of that ring at two different points, anteriorly and posteriorly. This region here represents uh, a mucosal fold, which is called eriepiglottic fold. And together, the epiglottis, the every epiglottic fold, and then the arytenoid cartilages, which are sitting right on top of the cricoid, they form the margins of the inlet of the larynx. So that's the inlet of the larynx, and through that, we're going to be entering inside the laryngeal cavity. Inside the larynx, we can see the vocal cords. The, there are two types of vocal cords. We've got a false vocal cord and a true vocal cord. The false vocal cords are at the top, which are known as the vestibular folds as well. And the true vocal cords are down below over here. Uh, then based on that, we can actually divide the laryngeal cavity into three subparts. This part here is known as the vestibule, extending from the inlet of the larynx to the false vocal folds, and then from the false to the true vocal folds or the vocal cords. This uh, area in the middle is the ventricle of the larynx. And then the area down below is the infraglottic part, which is going to continue down as the trachea. Behind the larynx, we've got the laryngopharynx, which we said is going to continue down as the esophagus.
Now, as part of the throat anatomy, we have already seen that the viscera's of the neck are housed deep inside the anterior cervical region. So if we move a little bit more superficially, we can see that the anterior neck region uh, can be divided into different uh, subcomponents, into different triangles. And let's just take the help of these two illustrations over here to describe those triangular regions in the anterior cervical region. All right, so now we're looking at the lateral view of the left lateral view of the neck over here and uh, this would be the anterior side and this being the posterior side over here. Uh, here we are looking at the, the neck region and the superficial throat region from the front over here. You can also appreciate uh, some part of the, the thyroid cartilage visible over here, the cricoid down below, the thyroid gland over here, the isthmus of the thyroid gland, and then the tracheal, C-shaped tracheal cartilage and the strings down below as well. Right, so now if you look at the side of the neck, it looks uh, almost like a rectangle. We can divide this rectangle into two triangles with the help of this muscle over here, which is the sternocleidomastoid. The sternocleidomastoid originates from down below here, from the sternum, and then inserts up over here uh, into the mastoid process and the base of the skull over here. We're not gonna go into the details here, but for now, let's just um, be able to identify this muscle, which is the sternocleidomastoid. Now, with the help of this muscle, we can divide now the rectangular looking neck into an anterior triangle in the front and a posterior triangle at the back. We're not interested in the posterior triangle because we're talking about the structures in the anterior cervical region as part of the throat anatomy. Uh, so this is our area of concern for today. Uh, the anterior triangle has its base at the top, which is formed by the mandible. Uh, the apex is directed downwards. Uh, the side, the three sides of the anterior triangle are actually formed by the sternocleidomastoid, by the base of the mandible, and then by this anterior imaginary midline in the front. Now, we've got two uh, muscles over here, uh, with the help of which we can divide this anterior triangle into further four sub-triangles within that anterior triangle. So what are those two muscles? We've got a muscle here, which is the digastric muscle. It's called digastric because it has two bellies to it, an anterior belly over here and a posterior belly over here. The anterior belly is attached to the mandible to an area here called the digastric fossa, uh, and the posterior belly is attached to the styloid process over here. And the posterior belly is actually attached to the to the mastoid process, and uh, we can see a little styloid process over here, which has another muscle coming off from it, which is the stylohyoid muscle, and that runs almost parallel to the posterior belly of digastric. So, and, and the two bellies of digastric are connected in the middle over here by an intermediate tendon, which is attached to the hyoid bone, which is uh, kept in its position by a facial sling on the hyoid bone. So now we've got a muscle here called the digastric with its anterior posterior belly and the posterior belly has got stylohyoid running along with it. Then we've got another muscle here, which is the omohyoid muscle. You can, it's, it's, you can see it's a long muscle. It actually comes from the, from the scapula, not clearly shown over here, but then it eventually goes all the way up over here, uh, moving, uh, traveling through the posterior triangle, entering into anterior triangle, and then, which means like in front of the sternocleidomastoid, and then it eventually gets it's attached to the hyoid bone. So that's a muscle called the omohyoid. Now, with the help of these two muscles, now we can actually divide the anterior triangle into four sub-triangles. So we've got a triangle over here. Let's just move in a, in, a, in a circular fashion, in a sequential manner. So this triangle at the top over here between the two bellies of digastric, this is our digastric triangle. It is bounded by the anterior belly of digastric, posterior belly of digastric, along with stylohyoid, and then the base is formed by the mandible at the top. So we've got a triangle here called the digastric triangle. Uh, different important structures are uh, situated in this triangular region, including the submandibular salivary gland, facial artery, and vein closely associated with the gland 
as well. Uh, but we're not going to be talking about those in detail today. Uh, then we've got another triangle here, which is the carotid or the vascular triangle. Uh, it is bounded by the posterior belly of digastric along with the stylohyoid muscle. Then we've got the anterior belly of digastric, and then we've got the anterior margin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle here. So we've got a triangle here, which is the carotid triangle, and it is the called the carotid triangle because the main component of the of this triangle are the uh, the carotid vessels running along with the internal jugular vein and the vagus nerve so we've got the carotid vessels over here along with their different sub branches which we can see running through the triangle uh, the carotid artery the, um, uh, the common carotid artery gives off two main branches which are the external and the internal carotid uh, the external carotid artery is the one which gives off several branches in the head and neck region here uh, to the structures which are outside uh, the cranial cavity and uh, we can see different branches popping off from the from the external carotid in the carotid triangular region as well so carotid vasculature is the main component of the carotid triangle then if we go down here we've got another triangle right uh, this is the this is the muscular triangle and it is bounded by the omohyoid then by the anterior margin of sternocleidomastoid and, and, and an anterior imaginary midline over here. It's called muscular triangle because uh, different infrahyoid muscles, which are long strap muscles, they are situated in this region over here. The muscular triangle can be seen a little bit more clearly over here. So this region over here is the region which belongs to the muscular triangle. Uh, and we can see these long strap shaped muscles over here, which are going to be situated over here. And then deep to those would be uh, our uh, deeper uh, visceral structures, which we already talked about, including the larynx and the thyroid gland. Uh, then after that, we've got another triangle, which is called the submental triangle, which is bounded by the anterior belly of digastric on either side and the hyoid bone down below. Now, that is an unfair triangle and cannot be clearly seen, cannot be really appreciated well in, in a side view. So we, we, let's have a look at the same head and neck region uh, from the front over here. The, we're looking at the throat region from the front here. We can see the hyoid bone down below over here. We can see the anterior belly of digastric here on the left and the anterior belly of digastric on the right over here. And so consequently, this triangle, uh, an unpaired triangle formed between these three structures that would be our submental triangle. Uh, even in this view over here, we can see the digastric triangle pretty clearly. We've got anterior belly of digastric here, posterior belly of digastric here, along with stylohyoid and the base of mandible at the top. So this is our digastric triangle. Right. So these are the these are the subdivisions of the anterior cervical region in the region in a more superficial plane in the throat region.